over here at the Rockland Range. We're going to do dairy for science in the parks. Uh, it's a beautiful day. We could have asked for any better day for this. Today we've got a special treat. We've got people from the Southern Pack Brewery. They're going to get a talk. Um, the treat about it is that they used to be Chipola students. Yes, we have former Chipola graduates here today to come talk to us. We're very excited. And we also have many Chipola students that have had presentations on dairy and the related sciences to it. So should we just get started? Talk about something else? Let's go ahead and get started. So first stop, we have Nikki and JD, and they're going to talk about lactose. Come on up, take stage. So today what we're going to be discussing is lactose. So, and the effects of lactose on the body, why people are lactose intolerant. So lactose is a sugar found without lactose or without lactase, your body becomes a Pepto-Bismol commercial. So you start to feel the stomach, nausea, heartburn, indigestion, and diarrhea. So, um, lactose makes up two to 8% of all of the milk products. So what happened um, 10,000 years ago was people decided they were gonna start farming. And so when they started farming, goats, cows, camels in the Middle East, they started to drink the milk. And so only babies are born with lactase, which is the ability to um, process the milk products. And so what was happening was our genetics were evolving to, for our stomachs and our intestines to make the lactase as adults. So 68% of the people in the world right now are lactose intolerant, which means that we are from ancient people. So people that are lactose tolerant are the ones that um, have been genetically um, evolutionized. They have the one genetic gene in gene two that produces lactase as an adult. If you, yes, JD. If you are lactose tolerant, you are the altered evolutionized breed of Americans. Um, now, if you are lactose intolerant, there are alternatives. So, I myself am lactose intolerant, and I refuse to give up my coffee. So, I use oat milk. It's non-dairy, and it's delicious. There's also Silk, which is like almond milk, and they have different brands. Um, Lactaid, I found that they have ice cream now that is like dairy free. I personally prefer regular ice cream. And <laughs> I will suffer the consequences later to have regular ice cream and benefit from that. So what we have here is a picture of the chemical structure of lactose just because Mr. Bates is here and I had to make my chemistry professor happy with a little bit of chemistry. And then, yeah, so that is what lactose looks like. And the chemical level, I guess. Any questions about lactose? Yeah. Um, what is the purpose of lactose? Like, why would people use it? Next up is uh, Meg Austin. She's from the Southern Craft Creamery. She's going to talk to us about some things to clean pasteurization. I wanted to ask you a few questions first. Okay. First of all, I already said your name. Um, when did you go to Chipotle? A very, very long time ago. So it would have been two, or 1999, and then I graduated in 2001. Okay. Um, what did you major in at Chipotle? Oh, I think it was just general undergrad. I don't know that I had a specific major. Um, yeah, I think it was just my A. I don't think I had a. I was, I was a pre-vet track. So you went on to do vet at? Yep, so I went to the University of Florida. I got my undergraduate degree from UF um, in dairy science and then my veterinary degree from there as well. Okay, good deal. And now you work at? So we have a dairy farm, Sunil Farms, and then we also have a creamery, Southern Craft Creamery, and a market. So. Okay. All righty, thanks for having me out today, guys. So um, I guess I'll just start a little bit with um, kind of a brief about uh, dairy cows and dairy farming and then talk about um, pasteurization since that's I think the science part that we want to talk about. So as a dairy farmer and a veterinarian, uh, my job on the farm every 
every day is to care for our cattle. And in return, they produce us with the high quality milk. Um, so our, my day to day um, kind of activities vary depending on what we have going on the farm. But every day will always consist of feeding, caring for and milking our cows. Um, and then there's things thrown in there. Um, of course, if we have some emergency go on where I need to do a surgery or, or um, help with a calving, um, or just my days where I'm doing herd checks and pregnancy checks and stuff like that. Um, but as dairy farmers, our main goal, as I mentioned, is to produce really high quality milk. Um, however, dairy farms are kind of dirty spots. As, as clean as you can get them, they're still cows and they still poop and pee a lot. Um, so with that is always the risk of transferring disease um, from the cow to the milk. And that's kind of then would segue us into pasteurization. So good old Louis Pasteur invented pasteurization and I didn't look up the date. You guys probably know better than me, but many, many years ago. And the main reason for that was for food safety because milk back in the day, especially without um, proper uh, refrigeration was really a huge concern for food safety reasons. It made a lot of people sick. Um, just because they couldn't properly store it and then also transferring things from the farm to the general public. So um, pasteurization and in, in, in various stages and various processes of it, but the, the whole kind of scheme or idea of pasteurization is heating the milk to a certain level or temperature for a certain amount of time to kill the bacteria and pathogens that could be in there. It doesn't mean they're there, but if they were there, it would help kill them. So for instance, on our farm and at our creamery, we use what's called bat or batch pasteurization. That's the lowest legal limit that pasteurization is allowed. So for our milk, if we were to take it from the farm and take it to our creamery for to be bottled milk, we would put it in a big stainless steel pasteurizer and it would be heated to 145 degrees for 30 minutes. Now that's just the bottled milk. There's lots of regulations depending on if you add things to that milk. So if Carlos and them are making ice cream, um, they actually have to increase the temperature because they're adding sugar and adding other ingredients to the milk to make the ice cream. If I am doing a chocolate milk or a strawberry milk or some flavored product, which don't ask me, I'm not doing it right now, but in the future we will get back to it when our new processing plant is open. Um, I have to bump up that temperature to 150 degrees for 30 minutes. So that's the lowest level that is allowed. There are, I think it's around eight to 10 different levels of pasteurization. And it gets as high as essentially ultra pasteurized or like your shelf stable products. So you guys are probably maybe familiar with some of those. Um, one of the big brands that, that does that is an organic brand called Horizon. So it's in the little kind of paper um, Tetra Pak containers um, and that's ultra pasteurized. And I don't, I think it's like 281 degrees for two seconds. So. There's lots of levels of pasteurization between what we do and then that super ultra pasteurized. Um, as a dairy farmer and um, someone who drinks milk a lot, I can tell a palatability difference between the levels of pasteurization. General consumers don't always notice the difference, but if you guys have ever had some of that ultra pasteurized or, or really high temp pasteurized milk, it sometimes can have like a chalky flavor. And the reason for that is purely just from the pasteurization and that heating <coughs> vessel. Um, so the people often ask us, do you guys sell raw milk? And we do not. Um, every state is different in this country. Florida does not allow legal sales of raw milk to humans for food safety reasons. Um, there is a little loophole and people can sell it as pet food. Um, but I always warn people, there's actually no oversight at all of those sales. So personally, while I, um, from a food safety standpoint, like just having pasteurized milk if we ever were if the state and georgia just implemented a new raw milk sales um uh legislative legislatively if we were to allow that i would be a proponent of it for the standpoint of then we would have some oversight then those farms could get tested and be under some overview and guidance and, and really have some, some checks and balances there that aren't there currently so um, but the, the main reason for that is purely food safety. I drink our farm's milk um, straight out of the tank. I didn't when I was pregnant and I didn't when my child was younger. Um, and I only do it now because I'm around all those pathogens that my cows are around every day. So trust me, I've consumed pretty much everything that they have consumed as well. So 
Um, but pasteurization is, is a really cool technology um, that's really helped with um, foodborne diseases and food safety as a whole. So if you guys have any questions, and I can speak a little bit on homogenization if you want me to, um, I got a thumbs up. So homogenization is the other main processing technique that goes into your bottle, your good old gallon jugs of milk. And it involves um, passing the milk through really, really tiny sieves or filters. And what that does is break down the flat fat globules in milk so that they no longer separate out. Because if you were to take milk straight out of a cow, it's going to separate out. You're going to have, oh, you're, you're going to have the, um, the cream layer rise to the top. And then it, it, not fully skim, but it will be more of a skim layer on the bottom. Our milk that we sell at our creamery is actually non-homogenized, so you will still see that cream layer rise to the top. The reason for them starting homogenization was really kind of um, for uh, convenience and flexibility. One, consumers then don't have to shake up your bottle before you pour it, so you don't drink all the cream off the top. And two, it allowed for easier standardization of milk. So if you guys go to the store, you know you can get good old whole milk, which is at least 3.25% fat butter or milk fat but you can also get others so you can get a two percent a one percent a skim and when by um homogenizing and by pulling all that cream off and then adding it back to make those different standardization levels it just made it easier for processors so there's no real health benefit to homogenization um it's just purely kind of a, a, a an ease for us as consumers um i personally like non-homogenized milk just because i can um, either drink the cream off and use it when I want or not. Um, and there has been some limited scientific studies to show that some people who are not truly lactose intolerant, but whose who milk still bothers, may benefit from non-homogenized milk. They, their, their body almost responds to those smaller fat, fat globules as kind of foreign, and so it starts kind of some irritation and inflammation. Um, so there has been some limited studies to show that people can more easily digest non-homogenized milk. So just something kind of interesting. Not been a lot of studies, but some. All right, you guys have any questions? All right, up next, we have Carlos Saley. Um, he is a Chipola graduate, and I think he's going to talk about it here in a second. Um, Carlos, tell us a little bit about your background and what you've done. So I went to Chipola in 2018. I graduated there from 2020, then I transferred to the University of Florida to receive my degree in food science. And currently I am planning on going back for my master's in the next two, two to 10 years, I don't know. This adult life thing is kind of hard. But um, yeah, I plan on going back with an emphasis on food engineering. Did you have any other questions? Um, why did you go to Oh, so I love Chipola because uh, a community college is a perfect place to get your feet wet without jumping in the deep end of college. So I could get the taste of being a college student, um, having the flexibility in my own schedule, um, being responsible, being more responsible for my grades and upkeep. Oh, yes, of course it's cheaper, but... Um, but there's a lot of like agency that I got that uh, with going to Chipola compared to just immediately going off to a big university when I had no understanding of what uh, it really meant to be a college student or anything like that. So Chipola was a nice stepping stone and also it was much cheaper. But so as a food scientist, uh, I take a different look at it's not simply just, wow, look at that spaghetti right there on that plate, or look at that ice cream. I look at it completely differently. I'm like, what makes up that? What makes that spaghetti? What makes up that spaghetti? Or what makes that ice cream? What makes up that ice cream? So today, I'm gonna to be talking about the chemistry of ice cream. So ice cream is kind of strange because the only thing frozen in ice cream is actually the water and for the ice cream. Um, but there's a few main components. You got your water, you got your flavor, which flavor can fall into a water-based flavor or oil-based flavor. And then you have your milk solids 
And then you can have other add-ins with like, for example, Ben and Jerry's, they put a little bit more fat to coat their little add-ins and things like that. But for the most part, those are the three main parts of ice cream. So as you adjust these different components, it adjusts things such as your freezing point. So that affects the scoopability of your ice cream. And it also affects the texture, which is the actual mouthfeel of your ice cream. So the mouthfeel, a uh, big portion of that is how many solids you have compared to how much moisture you have in there. If your water content is too high, your water will freeze and form large ice crystals, which then you can physically taste as you are eating your ice cream. And that is whenever you will call the ice cream grainy or uh, chalky, something like that. So you have to have a good ratio of water to milk solids, which that is actually what gives your ice body because your ice cream ultimately is just an emulsion of fat water and air so the what we do at southern cup creamery <coughs> since we use uh, cream line whole milk we have to be careful whenever we're making ice cream because non-homogenized milk has a higher chance of clotting and causing curds to form compared to homogenized milk when being agitated. So we have to figure some way out to stabilize this emotion while still staying true to our brand as using all natural ingredients. And that's why we use gelatin in our ice cream at Southern Craft Cafe. <coughs> gelatin, it increases the solid content while acting as a natural stabilizer Therefore, the fat, water, and air can stay emulsified and still be at a scoopable temperature. Another thing to talk about is flavor. So, as I said earlier, flavors can be water-based or oil-based. The water-based would have more of an impact on a sorbet or sherbet or something like that, which is at a higher temperature compared to an oil-based an oil base will have more of an effect in an ice cream or gelato wherever it's stored at a lower temperature. <coughs> so the oil-based flavors come through more in ice cream due to the fact that the water is frozen, but the oil is not. Therefore, your palate dissolves the oil. Well, dissolves not the correct word. Your palate detects the oil easier Oh my gosh, it's Miss Bonnie. Hey, oh. Um, um, your palate detects the oil faster than it would the ice since the oil is liquid while the ice is solid. And then it's vice versa in your sorbets and sherbets. That, that's about that's it. That's great. Real quick. Any questions for Violet? So, to make this work, I had to find a milk that was way higher in fatty levels, which is why I have whole milk. And while I get my ingredient list out, first I'm just going to pour a little milk in here. The way this works is that the milk and the food coloring I use is going to be, they're going to bond together by surface tension, which basically means that the liquid and the sur or an object on top of the li or liquid and then once I put a few drops of food coloring in there, I'm going to use this soap to break the um, bonded molecules together. And the way this works actually is because soap has two sides that basically inside of it. So one side is hydrophilic and the other side is hydrophobic, meaning the hydrophilic side is going to scrub it clean and chase the oils over to the hydrophobic side and it will create this firework illusion on top of the milk. I'll put it more over here where y'all can see it. So my favorite color is green, so we're gonna use a little green. If I can get it out. And I'm also gonna put blue and maybe another color like red. <laughs> I 
I don't know if y'all can see it up there on your little screen or like because of the camera. If not, you probably find water and make it thinner. Well, there is a tiny one. I don't know if you can actually see it. Up here, right here. Did you get that? For y'all that can't see, yeah. I just went exactly on my food coloring. And I could probably do it again for like if anyone wants to come up and actually see it. I want to go see it. Oh, yeah. And I just got this little cotton swab of soap. I'll make a few more little dots. Yeah. Um, I'm Jenny. I'm Jenny. I'm the president of Science Club. And next fall, I'll be applying at FSU to be in exercise physiology because my future career path is chiropractic. My name is Jared Holcomb, and I'm at Chipola. I'm a science education major, and um, I want to, I want to eventually get my master's and come back to Chipola and teach. Dead. Dead. Yeah. Dead. 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 So for this ice cream here, I went and I bought the same kind of milk. This is the uh, whole milk because. Uh, this requires like a lot of the same kind of fats as hers does, and I also used um, some sugar and uh, heavy cream, and uh, so two tablespoons of vanilla. And so, if Jenny, if you want to grab the nitrogen, so what this liquid nitrogen does, it's very, very cold, and so whenever you add it to this, it um, it keeps the uh, the fats and the water molecules small, and it makes them very, very dense and it immediately freezes it, which is, and then when you keep stirring it, it makes it into the ice cream like we know. Yeah. Okay, so last up here, we're going to talk to Dr. Amanda Clark. I wanted to ask her a few things about her life, I guess. So mm -hmm. tell us about where you went to school. I went to Florida State University several times. I worked there for a long time. I got all my degrees there, and I was yeah. also a biologist in there. And your final degree is? Uh, PhD in biology and science ed. Okay, good. And um, you, work, you teach at Chipola, right? What do you teach? I teach anatomy and physiology biology courses, and I do science education courses, elementary, middle, and high school. Excellent. And let's see, what else do I want to ask you? That's probably it. Anything else you want to add? Uh, I do. I get the opportunity, the wonderful opportunity to be the STEM coordinator for the college, which we do a STEM event for the local high schools in the five counties uh, once a year, and it's uh, awesome. It's great. And I get to be a part of Science Club. Excellent. And what are you going to do for us today? I am wanting to show something artistic about dairy and since the <clears throat> and since it's really important as I teach anatomy and physiology calcium is one of the most important things I teach in AP1 because without calcium we would not exist um, <clears throat> and that is for the sheer fact that you know uh, you know we produce milk uh, live young you know, mammals we produce milk we also need milk as a, as a primary nourishment for the first years of life, depending on your species. So it must be genetically hardwired for us to create milk. And a lot of that is the calcium and the sugars and the proteins that are in milk. So milk is a really important thing. And it's also a building block. It's a primary building block for all living things that are considered mammals. And so with that knowledge, we wanted to make that you know a little less you know luxury and have it more fun. So there's this thing that you can actually separate the products of milk, and we're going to do that. I have Nicole here. She's, I'm going to let her introduce herself, and then we'll carry on to a proper introduction. 
Yes, you're a science education yes, student yes. though, but I want to make sure they knew that she's an awesome science ed educator, future educator. <clears throat> um, and she's going to do this. So what we're going to do is we're going to take milk. 2%. Just, just milk. And normally we, um, and what we want is we really want the high fat content, but it's okay for just demonstrations because this actually takes three days to do. And so we're going to show you the first part and then we'll show you what happens after three days. And so what she's doing is putting vinegar in there and vinegar is an acid. So we're using the acid and vinegar to separate the fat from the milk. And this is what you saw just a few moments ago with cats and where she was using the detergent to literally flow along. This is a great way to do tectonic plates, by the way. You can show how they're flowing along uh, the food coloring and the detergent at react to the fat. And what we're doing here is we're separating uh, this and you know, usually you have to heat it up and if few minutes but it'll it'll do a little bit more trying to do it'll separate the fat and then we'll strain it and you'll pour out the watery substance from milk and we're left with the curdles the curdles that you use to make other food products but when you take those curdles or that paste you can actually take it and mold it into shapes which is pretty much what it does inside your body you get the water you need for all the, the viable uh, metabolic reactions that take place in your system and then you use the fat products, which has got the calcium and the nutrients and the proteins to help build your strong bones and your muscles, and especially the sugar you go to your brain. So again, calcium, it's probably the, one of the number one things I teach the AMP1, uh, homeostasis and calcium. But once you do that, that paste, uh, and for the fun part is, we can make things from it. And so we did, so to prove to you that your milk does actually build you, we made things. Now they have to dry for a few days, and so what am I, I'm kind of pleased with these. I made milk Santa earrings. Oh yeah, I made these on Tuesday. Look at those. Anybody, we'll, we'll be raffling these off to anyone today, today. See, milk is a building block of all things. So I made some little Santa earrings. I've also made for everybody smiley face uh, bracelets made out of milk. So you can have a cheerful day and make sure you get your calcium because it's very important for all living things. And then we also have Christmas ornaments, again, made out of just milk. So absolutely wonderful. Teardrop earrings. Anybody? Can I tease anybody? They go for a, 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 a we'll, we'll be doing an auction later. Anybody? Anybody? Candy cane little earrings. So we did these little milk bowl. And this is what we made from milk. And that was just the one thing that was to physically show you how milk does in fact build you because this is what it does in your body. So one of the coolest things about milk and I thought it'd be a nice way to end to let you know that calcium and milk are very important for you. They are very important for um, in the biologies. And that is the ending our presentation. Yeah, right? this unfortunately did not work because it was 2% and not whole milk. So. You can see there is a little bit of curdle going on. So there is a little bit of curdling going on. If it was whole milk, it would be very thick, very chunky, and then you'd be able to strain it and then form it. So unfortunately, because this is too well, it, and actually it did work. So I did have that thought process. I wanted you to, to talk about that because I'm not sure if a lot of people, especially people who are watching this, really truly understand the whole milk, one percent, two percent scale milk. And you're like, oh, it's less fat. But I mean, do you really understand like the fat, like what that is? And when you're young, you need as much fat as you, especially for your brain. Your brain absolutely needs that glucose. It needs that fat. But after the first year, year and a half of life, uh, they really try to tell you to start cutting that fat a little bit, maybe around two to three. So that's when they introduce like the, the lower fat milk products. Um, and then did y'all talk about how lactose is uh, in the DNA code? Yeah, that was pretty amazing how like, and Nicole and I are both lactose intolerant, which means we are ancient DNA. Uh -huh. And the new mutation is that people who are more tolerant of, of lactose uh, as they get older. 68% of people are lactose intolerant. So for the 68. first time, I'm actually like in the majority. <laughs> <laughs> Usually I'm in the minority. <laughs> anyway. All right, thank them.